Next up in our lightning round session is uh, Raymond Pun, who's our, from the uh, library with the smallest FTE population served of the day, 300. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and from that Alder Graduate School of Education in uh, California, and he is going to talk to us about integrating academic writing, research, and reading support for teaching education students. That's what it says in the slide there. <laughs> so go ahead, Ray, and take it away. Great, thanks so much. I appreciate everyone being here. So um, I'm here to talk about the work I do supporting teachers, so who are graduate students in education. We are based in California. It is a uh, master's program that's focused on retaining and supporting excellent teachers, about 300 to 400 students trying to get credentialed and become um, certified to teach in the state of California. Our goal is especially to diversify the teaching workforce as well. So when we think about the resources, you know, it's, it's so important to make that connection between writing and research. This is prominently you know, what we do in library work, particularly if you are in a school or an academic library, that, that kind of connection is so important because you have to think about, well, what resources can support writing and research? And so this is where I come in as the solo librarian supporting that kind of work. And one of the works we have done is work closely with a faculty member developing a, a writing sort of tip list. So, you know, just sort of things to think about, some things to consider. I, it's, it's so important to, to develop those relationships, right, with, with the stakeholders so that they are able to share it with their students and really engage and support them because all many of our students are first generation, maybe uh, first in their family, going to graduate school and, and so forth, and graduating from college. So, so all of this, even though they're going to graduate school, still needs um, whatever support we can do to provide it. So other considerations include working closely with your learning management system. We use Canvas, so developing an academic and reading writing course, right, where students are opting in to learn more about the database, citation practice, thinking about how they connect what they're reading, their experiences into their writing, and thinking about their, their voice as a writer, right? So that means acknowledging their perspective, their positionality, their biases that might come in into place when it comes to how they read, write, research, and pr think critically. So uh, this is also another opportunity I was able to formulate with another teaching faculty to teach webinars online. We are um, a in-person program, but we do have a lot of remote support. So this is an example here, thinking about persuasive writing, how do you develop your, your voice, or how do you include argument, evidence into your, your, your assignments, into your papers. So working with a faculty member to co-teach this sort of a, a opt-in session for, for our incoming students can be really helpful to providing that kind of support. Also an opportunity to think about, as I mentioned, reducing bias. So the uh, APA style format that many of us might be familiar with it can be sort of a frightening uh, approach because you might not be used to it, right, as, as students. And so you need to sort of ease them in into thinking about the format, but also thinking about this sort of important element of reducing bias because we all have, carry some sort of positionality and, and it's so instrumental to, to, to uh, recognize when we write, are we writing with a certain kind of bias um, and how we describe um, people, how we sort of describe situations and so forth and being aware of it. So what I have done most recently is gather uh, a bunch of students, about 300 plus, you know, to, to come together to talk about these sort of um, topics, but also to, to have a virtual gathering norm. If you're thinking about hosting something with over 50 to 100 plus uh, participants, you, you definitely want to have these kinds of uh, virtual gathering norms so that it, it really uh, uh, creates a sense of community and allows everyone to to really be engaged and, and also experience and respect each other, right? That, that discomfort, but also coming in being present. So when we do um, academic reading skills, we you know we teach different techniques. This one is one specifically on empirical articles. We sort of break through, uh, break down what a, a scholarly article or empirical article would look like, and then have really good conversations about it. And, and I think for many of us in the academic library space, we, we may you know have opportunities to engage with that on and off, but, but being intentional about it, it can be really helpful because these tips will help them um, thrive within their program. So I mentioned a little bit about the bias part. I wanted to also uh, highlight the wheel of power and privilege, which is really um, a graphic you see here. It's really powerful coming in from Sylvia Duckworth, looking at the lens that we carry. So we all have different positionality, power, privilege, and bias that we carry. 
And what does that look like when we bring that into uh, research, writing, and thinking? And, and even though it seems like it's sort of moving away from the libraries, it's so important that, um, that we integrate it all because research, writing, and reading, they're all connected. So at the end, you know, we bring um, the lens into it and it helps us really think about how we interpret, describe, and build on things and how we shape others' experiences and create meaning. And I, I think that's a, that's a powerful way to sort of think about why it's so important to, to, to think about the um, positionality that we carry as educators, teachers, library workers, librarians, et cetera. And so one of the other initiatives I've been doing is having a podcast series featuring our students, sharing their tips on academic reading, writing, research, and skill building. And it's been really fun to, to give them, get them an opportunity to, to, to share some advice and tips and how to advocate for themselves and how, to, how other students are listening to this can learn the, the skills to advocate for themselves too. It's a peer-to-peer -peer support. And finally, um, I just wanted to share, there's a lot of conversations about ChatGBT, a generative artificial intelligence tool that could help create writing through a chatbot conversation. Um, I, this talk isn't really talking about that, but I just wanted to highlight that there are questions to be using this tool, whether it's how it's being um, conveyed in terms of using a specific kind of lens, and, and there's a lot of backstory behind it. But there are also opportunities too, right? Like maybe considering ways to interrogate the response, interrogate the research and reading list that I could generate. And we need to analyze more of how this expository paper sort of develops um, because artificial intelligence is not going away. And there is a um, positionality statement, which I think might be helpful for those who are thinking about grappling with this issue. Um, obviously you could say artificial intelligence tools cannot be used in, in assignments. Et cetera, et cetera. But you might also include, hey, if you're going to write a research paper on um, maybe legacy in admissions, talk about your positionality, right? Write a statement on your background, your biases, your experiences on this topic. And so that is something that AI cannot generate because it's something that's really uniquely the students or the writer's own. So I think there's some, some ways to, to look at this, but of course, there'll be more opportunities to talk about that later. And so I sort of like um, explain some of these processes, some of these types of resources for you to consider as this is a lightning talk. So hopefully this gave, gave you some food for thought. And so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have uh, if you want to follow up via email. So uh, right. thanks so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. You can go ahead and leave that slide up so people can get down your email. Eh. Go ahead, put it back up. You should be able to still get it back up there. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much. This is the um, Coming from, I come from an academic background previously. This is great, yeah, things that definitely that libraries need to be thinking about. Um, comments coming in that, um, surprise, you had 300 plus students all at the same time in a in a Zoom. Yes, How did you cool. handle that? That was a lot. <laughs> and all yeah. being able to, act, act, to actually interact at the same time. Right, we, uh, we, we, we do breakout groups, we find ways to, to give them a chance to share. So I think it, it's, it's within an hour, hour and a half. So you have to really strategize. I have the okay. permission, a blessing from my dean to do this. I have coworkers who are also there, like one coworker, just to make sure things are okay. I think it's, it's, it, it, it's so important to, to plan ahead and communicate, you know, and then set the expectations. So the slide decks are shared in advance. Everything is transparent because we want them to have um, opportunity to view it in advance and ask questions and so forth. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, that would definitely need a lot of prep work. <laughs> um, the chat GPT that you talked about, that's there's been a lot of controversy about that. Someone is commenting, do you have any, any suggestions on how best to use it? Not, how do you deal with it with not encouraging, you know, the students aren't going to grab it and just use it to, you know, write their own papers and whatnot. Um, right. What are your uh, tips and tricks or how do you, how have you been dealing with that? Right. So, so, so right now we, we're still in discussion, but I've seen some other yeah. tools like gbt.me, which uh, uh, is a great tool developed by a Princeton graduate student, Edward Tien, uh, who has uh, created this tool where you can drop the assignments and sort of like look into it. And see if, and flag any questions that that may come up. Like it's 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 uh, looking at the res uh, the passages carefully. Mm -hmm. So so there's some tools that are being underdeveloped uh, and being out there. But for for us, I think it's more like just conversations on what what that looks like because there are opportunities to support 
students who are multilingual, bilingual emergent, um, sure, sure. students challenges understanding complex ideas, theories that 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 it could break down. I'm not advocating necessarily that, that we use this tool to, to do that necessarily, but I'm um, offering some some thoughts here. You know, that trying to figure it, still trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's so yeah. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. Um, if anybody, um, we do have to move along to our last uh, lightning round sessions. If anyone doesn't want have any other questions, please definitely reach out to Ray. He'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much.